one thing I didn't expect was a barbed wire. I think that's to stop people from, you know. Whoa. They know what they're doing, putting these seats here. So we can all take pictures with it. Ooh. Oh. Suddenly want to drive a boat. How good is this? It's like the perfect day. So I'm going to be chatting about my family history. Family. The side that we're all proud of. <laughs> this one is about the building of the bridge. And so I'll probably be narrating a lot of this this time so you can get more footage of exciting stuff and history rather than just wah face. It's amazing how bridges are built. I just look what they're doing here. It's forever in construction. So look, it's still in construction. <laughs> Meet my great-great-uncle John Bradfield. He was an Australian engineer who oversaw the design and building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, a heritage-listed icon which is considered one of the greatest achievements of his life. This year, the bridge celebrates its 90th anniversary. It is the world's tallest and widest steel arch bridge. So Uncle John, in 1912, proposed the idea of a suspension bridge to connect Sydney and North Sydney and submitted a cantilever design for its construction. Fortunately, it was accepted and he was also appointed as the chief engineer for Metropolitan Railway construction. All these projects were delayed due to the World War, but in 1922, work on the construction of the bridge started along with his proposed scheme of underground railway systems. It took almost nine years to build the bridge at a cost of close to 6.25 million pounds. That's almost 11 million Australian dollars in 1932. It took around 1,400 people to build the bridge with 53,000 tonnes of steel and used over 6 million hand-driven rivets to put the bridge together. On the 19th of March, 1932, the Sydney Harbour Bridge was opened the Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang, was to open the bridge by cutting a ribbon. However, just as Lang was about to cut the ribbon, a man in military uniform rode up on a horse and slashed the ribbon with his sword. He was promptly arrested. The ribbon was quickly retied and Lang performed the official opening ceremony and the bridge was named as Sydney Harbour Bridge. There was a 21-gun salute and an RAAF flypast. So that guy on the horse? He was identified as Francis de Groot. He's quoted as saying, I open this bridge in the name of His Majesty the King and all the decent citizens of New South Wales. The bridge's highway in Sydney and also the highway in Brisbane, the Bradfield Highway, is named after him. John also created designs for the underground railway system in Sydney City, known today as the City Circle. That includes St James Station, Circular Quay, Museum Station and Town Hall. He served as an engineer throughout his life. He devoted more than four decades of his life working for Aussie government departments, retiring in July 1933. But he wasn't done yet. The Queensland government asked him to build a bridge for Brisbane. And in 1934, he was appointed as a consulting engineer for the construction of the Story Bridge across the Brisbane River. The Story Bridge is Australia's longest cantilever bridge. And like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, is also heritage listed. The construction of the Story Bridge began in 1935 and was opened in 1940. And we can't forget to mention John's sister, Mary Bradfield. She was a teacher in Queensland and actually helped John get his scholarship to Ipswich Grammar. So thanks to big sister, John received an awesome opportunity. If it wasn't for Mary, John might have followed in the footsteps of his father and become a blacksmith. And then there's what goes into maintaining a bridge. The Sydney Harbour Bridge requires constant inspections and maintenance work to keep it safe and protected from corrosion. There's a lot of steel there. More than 100 people work on the bridge every day to maintain it. A huge task on the bridge involves painting. The steelwork of the bridge that needs to be painted is a combined 485,000 metres squared, or 120 acres. 
the equivalent of 60 football fields. Each coat of paint on the bridge requires about 30,000 litres of paint. Almost 80% of the steel used for the bridge was imported from the United Kingdom. Every now and again I see these, like, cloth. Another Aussie legend now comes into the picture. Some of you might already know this, but I recently learnt this. Australian actor Paul Hogan worked as a bridge rigger in the 70s on the bridge. He worked to ensure a safe rigging setup for all the workers, and he did this for about 10 years. What a legend. Paul, the bridge is still standing, so great work. Hang on, you missed a bit. <laughs> Just kidding. I love how the city of Sydney have set this up, so at least you can see the history. Hope you enjoyed this little historical story time. If you've got any questions or interesting history yourself, or even know some other fun facts about the bridge, or are even able to answer my question about what those rags are on each section of the posts, Please drop a comment below. I love reading them and I'm sure our community also loves to read them as well. Thanks for watching and see you next time.